All right, welcome everyone. Good to see every everybody back. At least, you know, the first 14 of you. We'll get everybody else in here soon enough, I'm sure. Um, so we are going to spend more time on conversions today. Specifically, we're going to talk about the quiz because a lot of you guys, um, this being your first real quiz, a lot of you kind of panicked. Um, and that's normal. I get I I get that every single time between the second and the third week. I get about it. I get about a dozen to twenty panicked emails over the weekend um, because either auto grader issues or you thought you understood it, but now you're feeling lost, or you did it right, but you don't realize you did it right. Um, all of those are really, really common things to um, to have happen um, this first real quiz. And so we'll spend some time going over it. And I know that there was some uh, some stretch questions on the homework as well. Those word problems were tricky, right? Um, so we'll go over we'll go over those and a lot of your homework are going to have one or two of those stretch problems where I want, where I'm kind of pushing you to think outside the box a little bit. The majority of the homework problems are going to be just like stuff we've gone over in class, but frequently we'll give you one or two of those stretch problems. Um, so I don't want you to panic when you see them. Just know that if I'm giving them to you, it's because you've, you have the tools, you might just not realize it yet. Um, those prop, those word problems could be solved entirely with conversions. Um, so you had the tools, but it's, it takes a little bit of practice to be able to see them sometimes. Um, and then uh, depending on how much time we have left over, we'll get into talking about matter and phases and temperature and unlikely we'll get to energy, but you never know. Um, and it, we'll, we will go from there. Um, First off, quick announcement. Uh, apparently on Wednesday, I just found out about this about half an hour ago. Um, but on Wednesday, there's going to be a Zoom conference, webinar sort of thing um, that's being put on by, by uh, LTCC's Student Life Department um, regarding climate change. Um, and so we're they're going to uh, in theory, remove all of the political aspects from it. Just talk about the raw science of it because um, cli climate change should not be political, frankly. It's, it's a, I'm still, I, I was alive for the process and yet I'm still baffled by the fact that it turned into a political wedge issue somehow um, because there's nothing controversial, political about it. Um, you know, if you want to talk about potential solutions to climate change, that's when things get political and policy comes into play. Um, and that's that's up for debate sometimes, but as far as whether it's actually happening or not um, and what best practices are to reduce climate change, that's not really political at all. Uh, so we will, I'm, I believe it's on, yes, says uh, noon to one on Wednesday. Um, actually on my schedule, it only says noon to 12.30. Um, so it might not be that whole time slot, um, but anybody who's interested in environmental science or climate change, highly recommend showing up to that. Um, and the more, the, the more turnout we get for events like this, the more we can get money for events like this at LTCC as well. So even if you already know about climate change and you're firmly into um, in one, one camp regarding best practices for climate change, I still highly recommend you come if you have the time, um, just so we, we can get an accurate um, picture of how interested LTCC students are in these sort of events and in climate change in general. So uh, again, if you have the time, here's all the info. Um, I'm not sure that this, this link is on the version of the slides I uploaded, so I will fix that. I'll upload it. Um, updated slides after lecture today. So this link will be on there. Um, and if if you notice that it seems like I've forgotten to do that, please remind me because it's entirely possible. I frequently make promises during lecture that I immediately forget when I close down the, the Zoom link at the end. So um, please let me know if I forget to do that. Um, so I can also tell how panicked you guys are as a group um, because generally speaking, um, I can use those ask me any question, qu 
questions at the end of the quiz, I can use that to gauge how well you're understanding the material. Because if I'm going too slow and the material is easy, then everybody's asking random questions about everyday stuff and nobody's asking questions on the material. But when everybody's asking questions about the material, that means that you guys are, as a group are still pretty shaky on this stuff and want some more clarification and, and uh, reinforcement on it. So um, these are, I've only done about the first third of the quizzes. So if you, I didn't get to your questions yet, I will get there um, later today or tomorrow likely. Um, but here are some of the questions that were asked. Um, one thing I did forget to mention, I think I, for, I usually forget to mention it, um, so I'm assuming I forgot it. Um, you do not need a separate PDF or image file for anything where I say upload a picture of your work. Um, you can, if you have it all on one page, you can just submit one file and you don't even need to submit it to both of the questions even. Um, that's highly encouraged. You don't need to crop it so that question two is here and then question three is a separate file, even though you had them on the same piece of paper. Um, you, can, uh, you can just submit it as, as one file, that's fine. Um, somebody stumped me um, by asking who invented the idea of significant figures. Um, and so I did a little bit of digging and um, I cannot find a definitive answer in the 10 minutes that I spent researching it. Um, so I'm, and I'm not a math history um, expert, um, but it seems like that the idea of, of not, not the formula for standard deviation necessarily, but the idea of accuracy versus precision and uncertainty in measurements um, actually was first put forward by um, this by a, a mathematician from the Arabic Empire in about 18 or the 800s uh, AD um, named Al Kindi, and Al Kindi was was a mathematician who was widely regarded worldwide. He was actually the one who in, who brought Hindu numerals from India and introduced them to the Arabic world, and the Arabic numerals are the numbers that we use today. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero, as they're currently written, those are Arabic numerals. And Al Kindi, the guy who who invented statistics, for lack of a better term, was also the one responsible for for the widespread use of Hindu numerals, um, which were subsequently and pretty close to immediately rebranded as Arabic numerals. Um, but they're very, very close to the same. Um, I thought that was that was a good question. I was fascinated by that. I'm going to have to do some more reading on my own time later. I love Wikipedia for stuff like that. Let's go down a little rabbit hole. Um, what are some examples of conversions used in everyday life or job scenarios? So I've gone over some of them. Um, but another one, if, you know, if you know how con how uh, conversions are used, they can be used in any job field from, you know, being a general contractor. If you want to know how much, how many, you know, dollars it's going to cost to buy two by fours to frame out a house, you need to know how many two by fours you need per foot of wall. You need to know how many, you know, and then when you can take that and then you can turn that into this is how many eight foot two by fours I need to buy. And then from there you can go to, okay, well, if every two by four is X dollars, I have no idea what it is right now. I know it's high. Um, then you can turn that into how many dollars you should be billing your client. So you know, how many, how many patients can you treat with a bottle of ibuprofen? It depends, you know, look at how many pills are on the bottle. Look at how many pills per dose per patient on average. You can set all of those sort of questions up as a quick conversion and give yourself an idea of, um, you know, how many bottles of pills you need or something like that. So everything from the healthcare field to, to construction, it's a immensely useful skill once you learn how to do it. Um, figuring out how much it's going to cost you to go on a road trip. You know, if I can, if I spend this much on gas every day and this much on a hotel every day, and I'm driving from New York to San Francisco, how many dollars is that going to cost me? That's a conversion question. Um, Here's a good practical one. When converting units, do you always put the first number over one so that so that you don't have any units on the bottom? And the answer is, well, not if you're starting with something that's already a ratio. If you're converting a speed, 
that's already a ratio, like 60 miles per hour, and you want to convert that into meters per second, you would put 60 miles on top, and then meters would go on one meter, or sorry, 60 miles on top over one hour on bottom. So a lot of times you, you will, yes, if you're starting from a raw number um, that doesn't is not a combined unit, if you're not trying to convert one combined unit into another combined unit, then the answer is yes, you are going to start with your first number over one. So there's nothing to cancel out on the bottom. But if you're trying to convert something that's already a ratio, then you have to start with it as a ratio, as a fraction. Um, if a number is given in a problem, how do you know if it's exact or if you need to count sig figs? This, I won't call this an art form because it is literally science um, and not an art, um, but it, it takes a little bit of practice to be able to see that sometimes. But basically, if it's not on your conversion sheet and if it's not a counting number, it's probably measured. Right? So any density is going to be measured. Any length is going to be measured. Any speed is going to be measured. Um, and the the test you could you could do to to kind of check yourself on that is if you added more decimal places, would it give you a better number? Would you have a would you get a more accurate number? If it's a definition, it doesn't matter if if we say twelve inches in a foot or twelve point zero inches in a foot, right? because we could write zeros out to infinity and nothing would change. But if it's a measured number, then adding more decimals is going to change it. So am I going 65 miles an hour or am I going 64.8 miles per hour? Or am I going 64.82 miles per hour? See how as I add more decimals, it's gonna get more accurate. That tells you it's a measured number. And what I mean by counting number is if you're counting physical objects, then that's going to be an exact number. Because if I say there's 12 eggs in this carton, it's not 12.0 eggs. It's not 12.1 eggs. It's exactly 12 eggs, right? So if you're counting discrete objects, you can assume it's infinite sig figs. That gets a little blurry when you get to really big counting numbers like stadium attendance, for instance. Technically, you're counting discrete people, so the uncertainty should be zero. But realistically, it gets really hard to actually count numbers that high without introducing some amount of uncertainty. Um, but for the most part, if it's a number that you get to by counting objects, it's infinite sig figs. It's exact. And if it's a definition, it's exact. Other than that, it's almost always going to be measured number. Um, why does it why does it finding standard deviation matter? Why is it that standard we can use standard deviation to throw out certain things? If we're taking these numbers ourselves, why can sometimes we throw out numbers if it's outside a certain range of standard deviation? Well, a lot of times if we're taking data in a lab, we'll be able to, to right away know we screwed something up. Um, say you were supposed to add 0.1 grams of something, but you actually added a, you know, an entire gram of, of a reagent. That's going to throw off all your numbers. So you might as well just start over and get rid of not even record the data from that run, right? Sometimes we screw something up and we don't know why. We think we did everything on the procedure right, but we still get an answer that's way far away from what we expected and what all my, our other answers are. That's where standard deviation comes into play because you're not allowed to just throw out that outlier unless you can prove mathematically that it is an outlier, that you have enough data points that are all clustered together. Therefore, this point over here by itself, something went wrong. If you can't point to specifically something that you screwed up, you have to prove that, that that data point is an error by finding a standard deviation. Um, so it winds up, we're not gonna spend too much time on the statistics in this class. You'll get find specific instances in all of your respective fields as you get into upper divisions. All, all sciences use stats in different ways. 
and all sciences are going to have their own preferred mechanism for determining if something is an outlier or not. Um, so I'm not going to we're not going to get into the specifics in this class other than the idea of you can't just throw out that data point you don't like. Um, and that's what standard deviations are for and why we have mathematical procedures for this. And the last one, this is this is one that um, I'm going to go on a bit of a rant here because has anybody heard of algebra triangles before or equation triangles? I've actually never had one taught to me in a class, so I don't actually know what they're called, but I know I don't like them. Um, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. So occasionally, some somebody will write this on a on their homework or on their quiz, where they they basically break up an algebraic equation into this triangle shape. So for you had density equals mass over volume, you could write that in this triangle as density, mass, and volume. And basically, whichever, whichever variable you're trying to solve for, you just remove it from the equation, and what's left tells you what the math is you're supposed to do. I really don't like these because you guys should know how basic algebra works at this point. You might still be struggling with it a little places, but this is a shortcut. If you want to know how to solve for density, well, you've got your, your equation right here. If you want to solve for volume, you don't need to write this out. You just do the algebra, get, get V by itself. There's no need for this. This is a shortcut that actually um, limits your understanding of what you're actually doing. I get I'm not going to completely stamp these out and I'm going to do my best to restrain myself and not mark anybody down just because you write something like this on a piece of paper. Um, but occasionally it's a close it's a close call because just learn how to do the algebra. You guys know how to do the algebra up here in this class. You might have to review it and you might not be comfortable with it yet, but we'll get you there. Don't take this shortcut. End rant. Especially for those of you guys who are going on into upper division science classes, you really need to get more comfortable with the algebra rather than than um, shortcuts like that. All right. So the first conversions on the quiz. Um, in general, you you folks seem to be doing pretty well on them. Um, the main things that that people had trouble with was um, I noticed a few people who went to go from ounces to milliliters went through pounds and grams first and then used the density of water. Um, there's a better way. If you're trying to go ounces as a volume to milliliters as a volume, you should be looking to just go through volume units, not mass units. Um, then again, I didn't actually specifically state that it had to be, that it was fluid ounces. So part of that's on me. Um, but in general, you can't just assume that whatever we're talking about is water and use that one milliliter equals one gram conversion. That's not a good assumption to make because we're gonna deal with a lot of things with different densities in this class. Um, the other one, the most common mistake that people made is not paying attention to the capitalization here. Capital M is a prefix that means mega, not milli. And Google doesn't recognize the difference. Google doesn't recognize capitalization. So if you just plugged it into Google to get a conversion, it'll give you the conversion from millimeters to feet. Um, and it, so I'm Fairly generous with that one, since you guys are still learning how to pay attention to capitalization on these, but especially with the prefixes, watch that. I'm going to I'm going to be very careful with the capitalization when I give you the problems. And if I meant to write a problem one way, but I forgot to capitalize something, you can either ask for clarification or do it the way it's written, and I'll just have to adjust my key. If I meant millimeters, but I wrote megameters, that's on me, not you. So don't just assume that I made a mistake, assume that I gave it to you the way I want it answered and just remember to watch that capitalization. Um, the other one that I think partly, 
partly gave people a lot of trouble because if you Google nano years, um, Google doesn't give you an answer as to what a nano year is. And so a lot of people got um, got hung up on figuring out nano years. But what we were really looking for here, we'll do it on the board here. So we have, if we have 14 nano years, Hang on, I got to zoom in on the whiteboard here. All right, if we want to go 14 nano years into seconds. So the abbreviation for nano years would just be NYR or just even NY, lowercase y is years as a unit. The first thing we have to do is if, if we're trying to convert time, time is really not that hard to do conversions with if, if we don't have any prefixes, right? So you can't just say one nano year equals 365 days because we're talking about nano years, not full years. So the first thing we want to do is take nano years to regular years. And once we're in regular years, we can take that and we can convert years to days, days to hours, hours to seconds. So it would look something like this, 14 nano years. And if you check the conversion sheet, the nano is 10 to the minus nine is the multiplier. So in other words, it takes a billion nano years is one year. Um, you could write it the other way too, where one nano year is 10 to the minus nine years. But again, this is the way it makes more sense to me is if I know it's a really small um, prefix, that means it takes a lot of them to make one of the standard unit. Then we can go 365.24, oh, that goes on top, right? We're gonna cancel out years. One year is 365.24 days. One day is 24 hours. And one hour is 3,600 seconds. Um, this is another case where um, I caught at least, at least one of you made the, uh, made a, reasonableness mistake here. Um, caught at least one person who put um, one hour equals 60 seconds. So their answer was off by a factor of 60. So again, normal. And when you're in a hurry on time situation, that's that happens, just try to limit it by paying attention to it. And then when we multiply all this out, I believe we get something like 0.44. If I'm remembering correctly, I'm going off memory, so that might be off a little bit, but it's about about half a second. We want to keep it to only two sig figs because we started with two sig figs at the beginning. Wait, check the chat here. Question on the exponent on the yeah okay so, so like yeah go ahead dana my question about the exponent is when you put the 10 to the ninth on the numerator you got rid of the negative right correct okay so there's there's two two ways of thinking about this now if we say that the, the multiplier is 10 to the minus nine mm -hmm that a nano whatever is a lot smaller than the standard version, right? So a nanometer mm -hmm. is a lot smaller than a meter, which means you could say, okay, well, a one, one times 10 to the minus nine meters equals one nanometer. Mm -hmm. We're taking the base unit and multiplying it by that multiplier. I don't like dealing with negative exponents if I don't have to. The other way of thinking about this, instead of saying, I'm gonna take a meter and I'm gonna multiply it by a really, really small number to get one nanometer. I could also say, 
it takes a whole bunch of nanometers to make one meter. Okay. So I could just as easily say one meter equals 10 to the nine nanometers. Okay. See how they're, they're kind of saying the same thing? Yeah, but that would only work depending on where it's at in the conversion, right? Like but I could just flip it. Right, you, you need to make sure that you get the convert the equality set up right. You wouldn't just want to drop the negative and put it on either side. You need to remember which side you're going to multiply. Mm -hmm. And so that's those these prefixes require you to, to think about it a little bit sometime. Sometimes okay, okay, I know nano is a really small prefix, therefore it's going to take a lot of nano whatevers to equal one of the standard. And 10 to the nine is a big number. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, if you think, okay, the multiplier is 10 to the minus nine, so I'm gonna take the standard unit and multiply by 10 to the minus nine to get one yeah, nano, one. whatever. Okay. It's, it takes some practice to see it. And again, sometimes practicing with the ones that you know, like centimeters is yeah. a good way to see how this goes back and forth. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, and so the, here's in the other aspect of this. Let me go to back to the screen share here. Um, is yes, I did not give you a conversion sheet that explicitly has nano years on it. I have nano something, right? Because these prefixes can be applied to anything. So any unit can have one of these prefixes. We do things in millivolts a lot, for instance. If you go into electrical engineering, you're dealing with millivolts or kilo ohms or whatever. So that you you just need to get used to, okay, if I see a prefix in front of a unit I recognize, that just means I'm modifying that existing unit. Um, and Kevin, you're absolutely right. Um, if you put this in scientific notation, it would be 0.4 or 4 point something times 10 to the minus one. And again, you could be off by one digit on the second sig fig, depending on where you rounded throughout the process. Um, and I, you know, and that that also goes back to the auto grader on Canvas. Um, I can't guess every possible way you guys could write a correct answer into the auto grader, and so frequently you will put in an answer that is right, but if you do something like add a space at the end of it it's going to get marked as 100% wrong. Um, so just know that I go back through all of them by hand and catch all of those. Um, and just know if you wrote the right answer but got marked wrong, that's, you know, you got it right. It's just that Canvas's auto grader is really strict and not easy to work with. All right. Um, and then the, the last one, the last part from the quiz I want to talk about is the density question, the density of graphite, which you can write it as a conversion. You can write it as a density equals mass over volume and solve for volume. They'll both give you the right answer. Um, personally, since we're in the conversion section, and if I don't have to, I don't want to remember extra algebra equations. So all you really needed to do for that one, for number three, was to make the units cancel out. If you know you've got, let me see, let me get it pulled up so I can write the numbers correctly and not confuse you guys more. The density is 2.25 2 grams per cubic centimeter. And you're starting with a mass of 12.24 grams. All you really need to do to make this work is to make grams cancel out with grams, and you'll be left in cubic centimeters, right? Because grams per cubic centimeter is a conversion. So you can just say 12.24 grams, and for every 2.25 grams, that's one cubic centimeter. Grams will cancel grams. You're going to be left in cubic centimeters. Bob's your uncle, right? 
So all you, you can get the exact same answer by solving density equals mass over volume, plug in your mass for M, plug in density, solve for V. Mathematically, you'll get the exact same answer. Um, but for these simple, for these simple algebra expressions like speed is distance over time or density is mass over volume, I find it easier to just treat it like it's a conversion. Prices, prices makes is an easy conversion as well. And percentages. Per, every time you guys see a percentage, it's a conversion. Because it's just, it's saying for every hundred something, there's 50 of something else. That is a conversion. And that's what you had to do for that tricky word problem, right? With the lead. Is you had to say, okay, Galena is this many grams of lead per 100 grams of Galena. And then you could cancel out grams of Galena and be left in grams of lead. And the reason that that's advantageous is because when we start getting, if you start dealing with percentages a lot, it's not always clear whether you're supposed to multiply things together or divide by percentage, right? Setting it up as a conversion is a good way to make sure your units are going to work out and you're not going to multiply where you were supposed to divide. And same with the density. The most common mistake you guys as a group made with the density problem was you just took the two numbers and you just multiplied them together when it should be 12 divided by 2.25. And so, and if you're writing your units when you do that, you'll see that you did something wrong. Because if you just took the two numbers and multiplied them, you're going to get grams squared over cubic centimeters, which doesn't make sense. You can't have grams squared. Yeah, even in, in physics, it's velocity squared you can have as part of uh, energy, the energy equation, but you don't have mass squared typically. Uh, unless you get into gravity. Gravity, because you wind up with two masses multiply. Anyway, though, um, not, not for the, it doesn't make any sense for your final unit to be in grams squared, right? So writing your units is key with these conversions. And then just doing your reasonableness check. Nano years is a trick you want to do a reasonableness check because you have no idea what a nano year is. Um, but you should know that it's a small number, right? So if you've got something like 14 nano years is 10 to the nine seconds, you probably did something wrong. All right. So here is another example of using density as a conversion. This was the last slide or second to last slide from last week's lectures. Um, if you have a density and you have a volume, it works the same way. We, this time, instead of wanting grams to cancel out with grams, we want milliliters to cancel out milliliters. So if we watch our units, that tells us Watching our units is um, a better habit to be in than using those algebra triangles, right? Because if you have the volume, we want the volume to cancel out with another volume to be left in grams. So a percent has 100 in the numerator, almost. Um, so it. When we think about conversions, they could be in the denominator or the numerator, right? So it depends on what you're doing exactly, but it, it's always gonna be one side, either the denominator or the numerator could be a hundred. So if I said, um, what's a good percentage? Let's say ABV, alcohol by volume. Let's say a particular beer is 5.6% alcohol by volume. Well, that is a conversion because it's saying, okay, for every hundred and pick, if it's a percent by volume, you can pick any 
volume units you want, as long as they're the same on both sides. So you pick whatever's con convenient. You could do gallons to gallons if you wanted, or milliliters to milliliters. But it allows you to say oh, for every 100 milliliters of the mixture equals 5.6 milliliters of ethanol. Since I'm running out of room, I'm not going to write out alcohol. Drinking alcohol is ethanol, E-T-O-H is the abbreviation. So, and we're going to get more practice with this, but anytime you have a percentage, there is a way to write it as a conversion like this. And then the 100 would either be on top or bottom, depending on what I was trying to cancel out. Um, also, if you're com comfortable taking percentage and putting it as a decimal, in theory, you could you can just divide both sides by 100 as well, right? Because a percentage is really a decimal. It's equivalent to say one milliliter <laughs> equals 0 0.056 milliliters of ethanol. Right, so you don't have to write the 100, but the 100 is the way, may, the way to make sure that you don't mix something up. It takes an extra couple of keystrokes on your calculator when you plug it in, but not a bad habit to be in. All right, so let's look at these. Let me actually break these up into two slides so you're not looking at both of them at the same time. So if we're trying to do this first one, this first one is partly, partly there so that you have to think about what what these dimensions on a sheet of aluminum foil are. We think of aluminum foil as being a cylinder, right? But the sheet is not a cylinder. A sheet is a box just with a really, really small height. So if you've got a width and you've got a thickness, thickness is another way of writing height, right? And what is the maximum length? So what we're actually solving for here is we've got a we've got a height, a width, and then a length. Um, and this is just a note about how I write, sorry, how I write lowercase l's to differentiate them between i's is I always write my lowercase l's as, as cursive. Um, you don't have to do that. It's just a way to make sure that you guys aren't confused as to why I'm throwing in Roman for inertia or current into this equation. Um, so all we really need, we want to solve for L. We've got these, and we know that the total volume is length times width times height. Well, if we know width and height, and we know what the total volume is, we can solve for L. So this is another density conversion problem, right? If I give you a mass and I give you a density, you can get to volume. And once you get to volume, you can plug in everything except for L and solve for L. I think if you do it right with these numbers, I think you come up with something like 84 meters, if I'm remembering correctly. It's a pretty long sheet of, of aluminum foil, but it's also reasonable, right? I'm not coming up with something that's in the kilometers range. I'm also not coming up with something that's only like, you know, 10 feet, right? So 50 to 80, 50 to 100 would be a reasonable length to solve for here. And I believe the key is on is posted with the homework, right? So you guys can check the answer there to double check it. But this is the logic behind it. Any questions on this one? It's one of those that once I show you the trick, it's really makes a lot of sense, right? 
as long as I'm the one standing in front of the board, it's okay. But when you've got a blank sheet of paper, it makes it really hard. Um, so one of the tips that I can offer when you get a word problem like this is to start looking at all the numbers that are given and start to say, okay, what variables do those match up with? What am I actually dealing with? I've got a width and a thickness. I don't know what thickness is, but I'm, I'm asking, I'm being asked to solve for a length and I have a width. What equation do I know that has both length and width in it? Oh, well, that's an area equation. Maybe that other one, you know, it kind of starts you thinking around along the right path. If you can start to recognize the units and the, the variables that you're, of what you're given, that allows you to start sort of thinking um, and strategizing um, in the right direction. I realize I didn't pause the share. so. So just for a recap for anybody who isn't able to see it on the recording, um, we're treating that, that sheet of aluminum foil like it's a box with width, height, and length. And length is what we're solving for. All right, for the second one, it was long and convoluted. But it's basically, it's you're going to need to use those percentages as conversions a whole bunch of times in a row and a little bit of geometry. Let's start with what you know. We're trying to get to a mass of, of this ore. We want to make a lead sphere with a particular radius. And then we're given a density. Well, the radius by itself is not going to allow us to cancel anything out, right? But if we have the radius, we could get the volume of lead. And once you get to the volume of lead, you can use the volume of lead to get to the mass, the volume of lead and the density to get to a mass of lead. And then you can say, okay, well, if I want... Let me clear this up real quick. If I want lead, a certain amount of lead, we can use a conversion and say, okay, well, for every 86.6 grams of lead, that's 100 grams galena. But you can't actually get all that lead out, right? So we really want, I put my calculator, there's, I have a spare in here, I think. And I'm out of batteries. So what do we get for the volume of the lead sphere? Anybody get that far? So you've got five centimeter radius. Volume of a sphere is on your equation sheet. Four thirds pi r cubed is your volume of a sphere. There we go. That number looks right. Thank you, Alan and Isabella. 524 cubic centimeters. So, and that's the volume of lead that we need extracted. So I'm going to add this extra little descriptive term to allow me to tell the difference between lead extracted or the lead before we extract it. And this is one where you might not want to do it all as one big long conversion. If you keep track of it by using your subscripts here, it might be advantageous to do this one conversion at a time. So if we know we want 524 cubic centimeters of lead extracted and every one cubic centimeter of lead 
And this is where we're going to start with the density. And then from the dense, after we use the density, every all those percentages are by mass. So we're going to be dealing all in grams. Once we do this density conversion, we get what's 11.34 grams of lead extracted. which is going to give us something in the 5,000 range, right? <clears throat> Five, two, four times 7.34. 5,942. You only want to keep three sig figs because we had three sig figs on 5.00 centimeters. So 5.9, what did I say? 9.4 times 10 to the three grams lead extracted. And I'm going to have to write kind of small here. So let me zoom in again. And we can, the problem says we can get, we can extract the lead with a specific efficiency, meaning for every hundred, for every hundred grams of lead, we can extract. 92.5 grams of lead extracted. <clears throat> you see, you can see how this is the point where being able to write these, these percentages as a conversion is helpful because your instinct might have been, oh, well, when efficiency is involved, I just take the number that I want and I multiply it by the efficiency as a decimal, but really we should be dividing by the efficiency as a decimal in this case. And then once we're in grams of lead, we can do the same thing to get from grams of lead to grams of galena. And then we can get from grams of galena to grams of ore. Right, you guys see how it's, this is a long and convoluted word problem but it's the same trick over and over again. Use, keep track of grams of what and use your percentages as a conversion. Does anybody have any other, any questions on the homework? I think those were the only two word problems, right? Um, the, the aluminum foil one in particular is one that I really like because it's not that hard once you can visualize it the right way. But it takes a little bit of creativity sometimes. That's an that's example of the sort of question that I might ask as um, when we get to the final exam. I always have um, one of the 10 problems is what I call a wild card problem. So 90% of the test, it's gonna be really, really well. Um, it's very, very straightforward, no surprises. It's the exact same type of skills we practice. And then number 10 is a wild card um, because I wanna see how well you can think on your feet. And I, that kind of separates A's from B's on the test. Um, this is the sort of question that I would ask on, on as the wild card question. Not that tricky, but it requires a little bit of creative thinking or sort of reorienting yourself to solve for length. And, and we'll keep practicing with them. If, if it didn't make any sense yet, but now you can see it, then you're making progress. And with a little practice, we'll get you to the point where you can, you can start to see some of these. And with that, 
man, this is perfectly structured today. I nailed this lecture so far. I like to spend the first half of class doing review and answering your questions and second half on new material. And we are just about to start new material. So let's take our 10 minute break. Um, any other questions you still have that you come up with about the homework over break, feel free to, to throw them into the chat or ask when we start again. Um, but let's come back at 2.30 and we'll start talking about um, matter and chemistry stuff.
All right, folks, let's bring it back. Um, and most of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day is going to be fairly conceptual. Um, some of it's just is going to be, I don't know, do, do you call it review when it's just experience from, from, you know, living long enough to be an adult, like you know what a solid is? Um, and some of it is, is we're going to be expanding on things that are common sense that you already know, like what is a solid? Um, so, but very little on the math front at this point. All right, so we're going to start with, this was one of our first definitions on the first day of class. We said, okay, well, what is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of matter. And we said, okay, well, now we need an, a definition of matter. Our definition that we came up with is sort of twofold. They tend to be linked. You can't have one without the other for most things. Um, so our, mat our working definition of matter is matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Um, it's just the, the nature of the universe that these two things are sort of linked. And we can basically define any mass as something that causes attraction to other mass. Um, but basically, so anything that's, that has mass and volume is going to be matter, so everything. And we'll get into some of the history of this if you take the Gen Chem series. Um, where the atomic theory comes from, but in this class we're going faster. Um, so ask in lab if you want to know some of the, the history of the atomic theory. Um, but essentially it came down to there, there are basically two options. It starts with a thought experiment. Um, a guy named Aristotle and a guy named Democritus had an ongoing dispute back and forth in ancient Greece about, I want to say this is about 2000 BC. Um, and uh, Eric, and it was, it was the idea that if you took a piece of copper wire and you kept cutting it and make cutting it in half, and then you cut it in half again, and then cut it in half again, eventually one of two things happen. Either you can keep cutting it until it's infinitely small, i.e., right? there's no point where you can't cut it in half again if you have sharp enough scissors, or you get to a point where you get to a small piece of indivisible copper that if you can't cut it in half anymore. Um, so Democritus said that that's, we're going to call that an atom. Atom means indivisible in Greek. Um, Aristotle, on the other hand, said, no, you can just, you can get infinitely small piece of copper. There's no limit to how small you can cut this piece of copper. Um, and they really went back and forth for a long time about it. And the what wound up settling it, they didn't, this weren't scientific theories at this point because they didn't have any way of testing this. Um, and the scientific method hadn't been developed yet either. They were just arguing about it basically. Um, and the, what finally made the difference is that Democritus died first and everybody knew Aristotle because he was one of Plato and Socrates' students who was, you know, made huge advances in other areas. So, because Aristotle was still alive, he literally went to Democritus's city and burned all of Democritus's writings. He was not a very good sport, uh, Aristotle apparently. And so we don't have, we have like only fragments of Democritus's writings for the most part. Um, and basically it got forgotten for 4,000 years until some, until some of the founding fathers of chemistry came across this idea and actually had the ability to come up with scientific tests for this hypothesis. So they named them atoms, indivisible in Greek, as sort of an homage to Democritus, who got shafted for 4,000 years of history. Um, and it, that is that definition, for the most part, still stands to this day. You can't split an atom without changing what that atom is. Um, if you did cut a copper atom in half, it would no longer be copper anymore. And so these different types of atoms arranged in different combinations make up all of the different matter that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so you wind up with 
things like water and hydrogen peroxide are going to have certain molecular structure, certain types of atoms combined together a certain way is going to give you hydrogen peroxide versus water. Um, certain, you know, if you take aluminum atoms and you arrange them the right way, you're going to be able to shape them as an aluminum can, although it doesn't actually look quite like this because aluminum actually has aluminum oxide. Basically, it's it's rusted very, very slightly right on the surface of aluminum cans. Um, so it wouldn't actually look like this at the atomic level. Um, but the those different combinations and different ways of arranging them are what give all of the different mass that we see its unique properties. And so we also need, before we even start talking about different types of mass, we're going to talk about different phases of the same mass. And this is, goes into the category of, oh, you guys have definitely seen this before because you are actually adults and therefore you know that water boils. Um, every type of matter can exist in multiple phases. And what we say by multiple phases means that different ways of arranging the atoms and molecules where it's still the same substance, but it's going to have slightly different properties. So water, when it's frozen as ice, has different properties than water as a liquid. Its physical properties are different just because you took the same molecules and gave them enough energy to become liquid. And on the flip side, you can also take liquid water and you continue to add energy, you can cause it to boil, right? And so we have water as a solid, water as a liquid, water as a gas, but it's still water in all of those cases. Right? And so what, what do I mean when I'm talking about these different properties? Some of the properties of water are, are the same when you go from um, solid water to liquid water to gas water, but some properties are different. So we kind of need a way of differentiating between different types of properties. Um, and what are these different properties? And the, the simplest of which we have some experience with so far is density. Um, and so every substance is going to have both physical and chemical properties. I'm sorry, Brooke, what were you referring to? Is that an and or or? Um, I was just talking, I, I kind of got it cleared up, but when you were talking about matter, whether it was, it has to have mass and volume or if it's mass or volume, but yeah. That's, that's one of those ones, we'll leave that to the uh, theoretical physicists to decide what, um, for the most part, if you have one, you have the other by definition in everyday world, but some theoretical physicists say that objects can have mass and take up no space and vice versa, um, but we're not going to concern ourselves with those. Um, all right, so going back to properties, um, we kind of have two different categories, and I have to teach you chemical versus physical as though they're two separate categories. I don't like that though. The reason I have to teach it that way is because if you take any standardized tests or go on to upper division science classes, sometimes they will use this distinction, but it's really more of a spectrum. It's not really a cut and dried. It's either a physical property or it's a chemical property. All physical properties are the result of chemical properties and vice versa. They're all tied together. Um, however, we have to cover it this way. So we'll, we'll describe physical versus chemical as being physical is related to the substance itself, to what the substance is. And chemical in general, the term chemical is going to be related to changing from one substance to another substance, from one compound to a different compound. So a chemical property might, might be like, um, Flashpoint for for volatile um, hydrocarbons might be an example. Flashpoint is the point where you could see it spontaneously ignite and start having things and have that substance start burning. Um, that would be a chemical property because it's related to the 
changing that substance into a different compound, CO2. Um, physical properties are going to be things like density. Density is related to what something is and what phase it, it's in, but it's not related to how easy it is to change it to another substance. Um, so, for example, here's some physical properties of copper. The color of the substance is actually a physical property. So whether it's shiny metallic or not, if it's a good conductor, that's all. That's a physical property. Um, the fact that it's solid at room temperature is a physical property. Its melting point and its boiling point are um, physical properties. If we started talking about copper being resistant to oxidation, we're talking about chemical properties. All right, so let's talk about some of these physical properties of solids. Um, so solids in general are going to be tight, fairly tightly packed atoms or molecules. And really the, the definite aspect of this is that fact that there's very little movement of the atoms. The atoms are not, do not have enough energy to move around freely. They're for the most part stuck where they are. So, and that's what gives, that's what results in these other two properties, definite volume and definite shape. If it's a solid, it stays in the same shape, right? And that's literally because the atoms don't have enough energy to move. If you want to take a solid and change its shape, you have to put energy into it. Liquids, on the other hand, liquids can change shape really easily because every individual atom or molecule has enough energy that it can move around the other molecule. So it doesn't stay stuck in the same shape. Um, they are still tightly packed, however. So they're not compressible. So we refer to that as a definite volume, but they have an indefinite shape. And then lastly, in gases, the atoms are really, really, really far apart from each other. I mean, not in absolute units the way we're used to it, but if you, if you um, think of an atom, if you think about, about um, an atom that was the size of a person, the average distance an atom would have to go before it ran into another atom in a gas would be about the same distance from here to Jupiter. So they've got roughly, we're talking interplanetary distances in between these atoms. That's how far apart they are as a gas at normal pressure. So if they're that far apart, there's nothing keeping them from being compressed. And so that's why gases will expand or contract to fill whatever, whatever space is available because there's a lot of empty space that you could fill in. Um, we're going to talk about these in terms of energy here coming up pretty soon. So um, I like to use an, an analogy of going to a concert for the three phases. Going to a, a concert where you have assigned seating um, and actual seats, that's like a solid. Low energy, you're usually talking about, you know, yacht rock or classical music or something like that. Um, Liquids are like general admission floor seats. Like there's no actual seats. You're there, everybody can move around, but you could still get from the back to the front or vice versa. There's a little bit of movement, even though everybody's still packed together about as closely as you could be. And then gases are like your mosh pit. Lots of space, highest energy shows is when you're going to see all that open space. And you can kind of have some movement in between these, right? If you took a venue that had seats um, and you had gave it lots and lots of energy, like you filled it with metal heads and had, had motorhead perform, um, you're gonna go through a phase change pretty quickly. It's not going to stay assigned to seating very long, right? Very quickly that will degenerate into general admission and then mosh pits, right? So adding energy is going to allow you to move through these different phases.
All right, so let's talk a little bit about what energy is, and then we can talk about how these, these ideas all interact with each other. Um, if you start from Isaac Newton, who, you know, the founder of modern physics for the most part, um, he came up with a definition of energy that was based on the macroscopic scale, meaning on the scale of objects you can actually see. You can measure their speed. You can see where they are. You can measure their weight. And, and so the, the physics definition of energy is that energy is a property of, all, of objects, and all objects have some amount of energy. Um, and it's defined as the, the ability to do work. Um, and when we say the ability to do work, we're not talking about, was it Robin Big, do work, son? Um, we're not talking like that work in the physics sense of the work is changing the velocity of an object. So in other words, you're, you need to either be redirecting something or if it's starting at a stop, you're pushing it, that's doing work. Um, so energy is any, is the ability of any dis object to do work to, to another object. Um, that really doesn't do much for us because we're not we're going to be measuring things that are really, really small in chemistry. Um, but we can actually further divide energy into kinetic energy, um, which is in kinetic just means movement, right? And so kinetic energy is the energy associated with things moving. And potential energy is energy that an object has that's not in the form of movement, basically, which is basically everything else. Every other form of energy is potential energy. If it's not something moving, it's potential energy. So for instance, we're gonna talk a lot about energy in the terms of energy changing forms or changing hands, because that's how we usually measure it, right? Energy is the ability to do work. So frequently we will actually measure a change in energy because we can't measure all of the intrinsic energy of an object. So if we have water and water was flowing downhill, when it's uphill, it's got lots of potential energy. As it flows downhill, that potential energy is being turned into kinetic energy. Um, if you go rock climbing, you can turn kinetic energy into potential energy. You are using the movement of your arms and muscles to move further away from the ground. The act of getting further up is you're putting more potential energy into your body at the expense of your kinetic energy. However, we're not going to be dealing with objects we can actually see that much. Um, we're going to be dealing with kinetic energy and potential energy at the atomic level. And so we care more about things like temperature. Temperature is energy as well. Temperature is kinetic energy even. Sometimes physicists will differentiate and they'll say kinetic energy versus thermal energy. No, thermal energy is kinetic energy. We're just talking about how fast the atoms themselves are vibrating, how fast the molecules are moving around is, it's in terms of, of units of degrees, temperature is directly proportional to kinetic energy, which means it's a one conversion away. Um, so, Temperature, that's, that's all temperature really is, is our way that we can actually measure the kinetic energy of individual molecules. And this link here, if I pull this up, is a fun simulation where we can look at different phase changes that are happening if we, so we can, show it as though we were um, able to see the individual atoms. So if we had some, if we had a solid and it's a very low temperature, 
we can actually see that it's basically all those atoms are not really free to move about very much. But as we start adding energy, we'll see that they're able to start moving around a lot more, right? And you start to lose that definite shape. We heat it a little bit more, get it to spread out e even more. And then all of a sudden we get random little bits of start flying off and becoming gas. So this, that's actually the process of evaporation happening. We're seeing some of these, some of these atoms actually generate enough, have enough energy that they can kind of escape the attractive forces that are holding them attached to the other atoms. Uh, if we look at water molecules, for instance, we're at 286 Kelvin, which is um, above zero, but less than room temperature. Um, we've definitely got a good little liquid system going. They're definitely moving around, but they're not freely moving. There's definitely has a definite volume to it. And if I pushed down on it, it's not going to get a whole lot smaller than the volume it already has, right? I can crush it down a lot, a little bit, but then if I push it too much, it winds up, the pressure winds up being too much and you wind up breaking your system. Um, I forgot it did that. So if I can add some more in here, we can see it again. Um, but adding, adding uh, energy to the system by way of adding pressure or increasing heat is going to change how they all behave to each other. You notice the more I push down on this, the faster they're moving because I'm adding energy into the system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about temperature. If temperature is the way we can measure the average kinetic energy of these molecules, stands to reason it's going to be fairly important in this class, right? We can't measure kinetic energy the way we do in a physics class by taking a stopwatch and weighing something. We can't just weigh a bowling ball, roll it, and measure how fast it's going to figure out how much kinetic energy it has. We can't measure individual atoms at all. But what we can do is measure temperature. So temperature scales wind up being very important in chemistry because they're going to govern a lot of the processes that happen in chemistry. Um, for instance, phase changes. Um, and so the, the most common temperature scales are all shown here. And the one that we're most used to, unfortunately, is Fahrenheit. Um, and Interesting, interesting note about Fahrenheit. Um, well, we'll start with Celsius. Celsius makes the most sense for everyday use for people because Celsius, we took, took some really important temperatures and we basically used them to set the rest of the scale. So we said, okay, water is the most important, is the most important substance to humans and it's really common. We're just going to set, set the melting point of water at zero Celsius, we're going to set the boiling point of water at 100 Celsius, and we're going to just evenly divide up the distance between those two. That's not how Fahrenheit works, right? Um, Fahrenheit was, was uh, designed by a guy, I want to say he was British, um, who actually he was a lord in the, I want to say 1600s, um, who owned a lot of cattle. In, so he actually defined zero as the coldest he could get a mixture of water and salt. It was basically the coldest thing that he could make on a regular basis that was consistent. So he said, okay, we're going to call that zero Fahrenheit. Um, and then he said 100 Fahrenheit is the body temperature of a cow because he owned lots of cows. And he could have said it to be the body temperature of a human, but humans weren't as important to him as cows, apparently. So um, the 100 Fahrenheit is the body temperature of a cow, which means the boiling point of water is 212 Fahrenheit, which is really nasty and a pain to have to deal with. Um, we're gonna stick to using Celsius for the most case. I'm gonna ask you to do some conversions from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, when we start talking about gases in more detail, we'll see why we have to use Kelvin. Um, but essentially, Kelvin is the same scale 
as Celsius, it's just shifted over. So that instead of calling zero where water melts or where ice melts, we call zero the point where you can't get any colder, which is known as absolute zero. Basically, we can extrapolate from, from some graphs um, where if we measure, say, the energy of, of a system and temperature, we can say, okay, well, I get a straight line as I increase temperature, but it doesn't end at zero. So there has to be some point where, where we get to a point where you can't get any colder because you can't have negative kinetic energy. You could have zero kinetic energy, but you can't have negative kinetic energy. So they basically just followed the slope of that line, and found the x-intercept, and then decided, OK, here's our x-intercept. We're calling that 0 Kelvin. And that's, so that's where the term absolute 0 comes from, because you literally can't get any colder than 0 Kelvin. It's the point where all molecular motion stops. And how you can't go slower than 0, right? You can't go slower than not moving. Because even if you were moving backwards, you would still be moving, right? Um, so when you hear the term absolute zero, that's what we're talking about. And the conversion from Celsius to Kelvin, I, I said that Kelvin and Celsius are like the same scale, but shifted. It means it's a really easy conversion from Kelvin to Celsius. If you have a temperature in Celsius and you want it in Kelvin, you just add 273. Absolute zero is at negative 273 Celsius. And so they have the same increments. It's a, it's a 100 degree Kelvin difference to go from zero Celsius to 100 Celsius as well. So it's a, just an additive conversion. It's one of the first time, the only times we'll see an additive conversion. Um, but it is, it's, so it's worth paying attention to, and it's got its own spot on the equation sheet too, right? Um, if I pull up the equation sheet, and again, also while I'm bringing up the equation sheet, worth noting for everyone, um, don't just Google for your conversions because a lot of time Google doesn't understand prefixes very well, and they'll try to think for you. And we don't want that. Um, temperature gets its own section on your conversion sheet because it has they're a little bit more complicated. So temperature in Kelvin equals temperature in Celsius plus 273.15, and that's a measured number. Temperature in Fahrenheit has an even more because the a one degree Fahrenheit difference is not the same as a one degree Celsius difference. So we have a different scale there. Um, and so that's why the equation is a little bit more complicated. Um, 1.8, for every change in one degree Celsius, it's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit difference. That's what the, it's basically the slope of the line. Um, if you, and then you wind up adding 32 to it. So, and these are exact numbers, they actually redefined the Fahrenheit scale to match Celsius and we're calling these exact numbers. Um, just the same way that we, we define 2.54 centimeters is exactly one inch. Anybody happen to know the temperature where Fahrenheit and Celsius are the same? If you plug in X for temperature Fahrenheit and for temperature in Celsius, you can solve for X. You actually get a number, which is where you don't have to specify if you're talking about Fahrenheit or Celsius because it's the same. I believe comes out to exactly negative 40. Negative 40 is the same in Celsius and Fahrenheit. Not sure why you would need to know that, but now you do. You never know when there's going to be a science round when you go to trivia night, right? You don't want to be the science major who can't answer the science trivia round. All 
All right. And actually, incidentally, some if uh, everybody keeps asking me what are what are everyday applications for conversions in your day to day life. Um, well, it wasn't for my job, but I definitely was able to answer some trivia questions when I was in grad school because I did some conversions on the back of a napkin. Um, related to, I think the one that comes to mind the most is figuring out how far the moon is from the earth as a multiple choice question. You can actually figure that if you know the speed of light and how long it takes light to get to the earth from the sun, you can figure out how far the moon is roughly. All right, so we have some practice converting temperatures here and Baron, and the, these are going to be the ones where we want to pay attention to your sig figs because it's easy enough. You're not just going to be able to keep the same number of sig figs at the end because we have some addition happening. So if we have ethanol boiling at 78 Celsius, what is that in Fahrenheit? What about in Kelvin? And while you guys start working on that, yes, Kelvin does not have a degree next to it. Um, I don't know who decided that we weren't doing that. Um, but yeah, there's no degree symbol next to the K for Kelvin. It's just a capital K is your unit for Kelvin. So to get to Fahrenheit, we're, we have it in Celsius. We're just going to plug 78 in there. The units get a little bit weird. Um, the, the units on the 1.8, if we're being really careful with our units, our units on 1.8 would be degrees Fahrenheit per degree Celsius. So you would wind up with degrees Celsius canceling out. Let's show you what I mean there. One point eight degrees Fahrenheit per degree Celsius. Right. And so if you then plug in seventy eight Celsius, Celsius cancels Celsius, and you'd wind up in degrees Fahrenheit, but it gets a little bit. The slope, the slope basically is how many, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, one, one degree Celsius difference is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit difference. And so that's what the, where the units actually come from on this. And the 32 is an absolute mod, it's a y-intercept essentially. So it's just in degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we'd wind up with our temperature in Fahrenheit being 1.8 times 78 plus 32, we get 172.4. The question is, how many sig figs do we keep? All right, so we have to do the multiplication first. So we get Fahrenheit equals. So the 1.8 times 78, you can't plug it in all at the same time. We get 140.4. And we have to only keep two sig figs because that 78 Celsius only has two sig figs. 1.8 is exact. So that means we have to say, we have to write it in scientific notation or include a plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit.
And then we're going to add 32 to that. And now we're going to keep the same uncertainty because we switched rules. So keeping the same uncertainty, when we add 32, we're going to get 170 plus or minus plus or minus 10. Or you can put it in scientific notation. One seventy degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus ten Fahrenheit, or one point seven times ten to the two degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't know the keyboard shortcut to add degree symbols in quickly, so I'm not going to put the degree symbols in. If you're writing this by hand, you would want to put the degree symbols in. So those of you who said two. Absolutely right, which is tricky. And so in this case, because we multiplied first, it winds up being, we wind up keeping the same number of sig figs that we started with, but it won't always be that case. With this conversion, you can actually gain a sig fig if that plus 32 takes you in from something just under 100 to something over 100. So for instance, if we plugged in, um, if we plugged in um, like thir uh, 39 Celsius, we multiply that by 1.8 and then add 32, we get something over 100 Fahrenheit. But because we're gonna be try trying to keep the same uncertainty when we add that 32, we actually wind up gaining a sig fig in that case. Right, so for these ones, you need to break it up by the steps. Um, the degree symbol goes before the F. So it's in the sake, for the sake of showing you consistency here, let me find my insert symbol. There it is. So it would go. Degrees Fahrenheit. And might as well put it in here all over the place to make it as consistent as possible. All right. Let's, uh, so this is as good a time as any as well to remind you that um, you may not, after the end of this lecture, you may not have enough information to do all of the homework because the homework starts getting into some energy units and temperature change stuff. We're going to cover that in, on Wednesday. Um, so between now and Wednesday, I would get the lab done. Um, and then if you're, if you're going to be working on this, I wouldn't spend time working on the homework. Some of the homework you can do, like the temperature conversions and stuff like that you can do. Um, but for some of the other, the other parts of the um, energy homework, you might want to wait until after Wednesday's lecture um, to, to get all the information you need. All right, if ethanol freezes at negative 173 Fahrenheit, what temperature is that in Celsius? And then in Kelvin, oh, I guess we should finish and do uh, Kelvin for the first one. Kelvin's, if you already have your temperature in Celsius, Kelvin's really easy. So if temperature in Kelvin is just going to be equal to temperature in Celsius, plus 273.15. So we plug in 78. And do I still have, I do still have it in my clipboard. 
degrees Celsius plus 273.15. And we'll get a temperature in Kelvin. Of what's that wind up being? Two sixty one or three sixty one, three fifty one, three fifty one point one five. When you plug it in. And that's in Kelvin. Where do we need to round? All we did was add, right? So we need to keep the uncertainty in the same place. 78 was plus or minus one degree Celsius, right? Which means our answer needs to be plus or minus one. So we're going to round to the ones place. So we would get temperature in Kelvin is 351 Kelvin. What about the scientific notation for this? We don't have two sig figs. So if we if we wrote it in scientific notation, we would include all of those digits. It would be three point five one times ten to the two. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I got. Would that be wrong then? Or... No, never never wrong to put it in scientific notation. Um, okay. Sometimes more trouble than it's worth if it's easy to write it out in as an unambiguous number. But writing oh. 3.51 times 10 to the 2 Kelvin is just as correct. Okay. When in doubt, put it in scientific notation, because you're never going to make it wrong by putting it in scientific notation. But leaving it in standard notation, you could make it, you could be wrong. For instance, our 170 number. We had to put 170 Fahrenheit into scientific notation so that we knew exactly where the uncertainty was. All right, so let's do another one. I'll let you guys get a head start on this one. Ethanol freezes at negative 173 Fahrenheit. What temperature is that in Celsius? And what about in Kelvin? So are these um, like formulas that are written at the top of the page, are those for everything or are those just for these equations? So those are for any time you're converting temperatures. So okay. it's only, it's, they're, they're a lot like regular unit conversions, but you can always, because you can't say that zero Fahrenheit is the same as zero Celsius, you can't do it like a regular conversion. You have to have these more complicated conversions.
All right, so first to get it to Celsius, because you've got to get it in Celsius before you can go to Kelvin. Start by just plugging in the number you're given in for Fahrenheit. And then we have to do the algebra to solve for Celsius. So we subtract 32 from both sides. We have to do that before we can divide both sides by 1.2. So 173 minus 32 gives you negative 205. Unless my mental arithmetic's off. Okay, I got that right. Good. Um, and then when you, if you do negative 205 over 1.8, negative 100 and 113.8 repeating. So how do we know where to round here? Well, our starting number started as plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. We subtracted 32, so we're gonna keep it plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. Then if we take the negative 205 and divide by 1.8, now we're in the division realm, right? So we had three sig figs here, and now we're dividing, so we're going to keep it to three sig figs. So that means we're going to keep our uncertainty to the ones place. So after rounding, get 114. If you did your rounding a little differently, you might have gotten 113.3 one um, instead of 113.8. That's fine because we're still only off by one in this last digit that we're writing down, right? So now we've got negative 114 Celsius to get to Kelvin. Plug it in. Temperature in Kelvin equals temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So temperature in Kelvin equals negative 114 plus 273.15. So our temperature in Kelvin winds up being one fifty nine point one five. And since all we did was addition. We're keeping our uncertainty in the same place. So we plus or minus one on our 114. So we've got to round to the ones place here. So 159 Kelvin. And so just for reference, uh, liquid nitrogen boils at 78 Kelvin, I want to say, somewhere right around 80 Kelvin. So we're roughly twice as much, twice as hot as liquid nitrogen is where um, ethanol freezes. We can't say twice as hot. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you can't say twice as hot unless you're in Kelvin units. Because you can go less than zero in Fahrenheit, right? So going from 50 Fahrenheit to 100 Fahrenheit is not twice as hot. You have to double the temperature in Kelvin 
in order to be actually twice as hot. And so that's the reason why twice, we never hear anybody say twice as hot, right? Um, or it's half the temperature because nobody thinks in Kelvin on a day-to-day -day basis and it's just plain out physically wrong to say that it's half the temperature unless you're in Kelvin because you can go to less than zero in Celsius and in Fahrenheit. One last note. Kelvin will never be negative. Reminder, if you calculated Kelvin wrong, either you did something wrong or your number that you're starting from is just wrong. Because you can, you can also never have a temperature in Celsius that's lower than 273 Celsius, negative 273 Celsius. If you get a number that's less than zero in Kelvin, double check your work. And if you can't see a place where you messed up in your work, ask whoever wrote the problem or assigned the problem. All right, so that's a 100% classic red flag for your reasonableness check. If you ever get negative Kelvin, huge red flags, alarms blaring. And with that, that is a perfect time to end for the day. So I'll see half of you in uh, lab in a little bit. We're working on Labster simulations. So if you wanted to get started on that Labster simulation, um, I'm going to tweak it and add some problems to it. So come, so um, everybody come, or you don't need to come to lab today if you just want to get started on the Labster simulation, but do check back when you're done to make sure that you get the uh, the questions I'm going to add, uh, as it'll be a, as a separate assignment, just like week one. All right, all right, everybody. If I'm not going to see you later, have a good day. Thank you. Have a nice day.